what kind of Queensland do we want and how will we know if we're achieving it? Well, for me, that gets to the heart of what I want to talk about this afternoon. May I say initially that there are two separate questions in that phrase, measuring our vision. First of all, what is our vision? Do we have a vision? Is it a shared vision? And secondly, how do we measure progress towards it? And I would like to add a third question, how do we involve the community in that process? Because I want to argue that community engagement in shaping our vision and in helping measure it is crucial to its legitimacy and to our democratic legitimacy, but also to its policy so effectiveness. I want to divide my talk this afternoon into two halves, effectively. The first is to talk about the idea of progress and visions, what they are, what we have in Australia if we do have such a thing, and how we should decide what our vision is, who should be involved in that, and also to say something about the growing global movement, which has developed in the past decade, to develop better measures of progress for societies which is very much recognising the need to have an integrated vision of progress and one which engages citizens. And the second half of my talk will be about a project which I hope addresses these questions directly, the Australian National Development Index, of which QCOS is a partner, which is a major national project which is attempting to engage over the next two years half a million Australians in a conversation about what kind of Australia we want and developing a national index of progress which reflects what is important to citizens as well as indexes in 12 critical areas such as health, education and justice. To come to the first question about visions and progress, of course what our vision for our society is and what we call progress is a contested issue and it's something that has been contested for a very long time. Whether we see a vision in terms of social betterment or economic improvement or political power or human rights or all of these things. But there are some common sense straightforward observations about measuring progress and measuring progress towards a vision that we ought to acknowledge from the start. The first is this. Measuring progress clearly implies that you have a destination, that you know where you're going. You can't really measure your progress if you don't know where you're going. We tend to forget that when we rush into measures. First question is where are we going and do we know and do we agree? The second question I suppose is that when we talk about a vision for the future, it implies a certain attitude to the future. Now, you can have a different attitude to the future. You can say that the future is a kind of destiny that's going to be wrought by others and that's something we have to face up to. Or I guess you can say that the future is a place that we are making by what we do now, as the US futurist John Shah put it, a place that we are making by what we do now and which changes us and the destination as we make it. So we have to have, I guess, the view that we are capable of achieving our vision. And another thing to say about visions of the future and progress is that the way we define progress in a society isn't simply an empty philosophical or ethical issue. It becomes very powerful in actually determining the outcomes. The formal, official definitions of what is progress or the most important goal of progress in Australia or any other country is important. John Howard said memorably 10 years ago that Australia's main goal was to achieve a 3% uh, increase in GDP as a nation. Some people would argue that there are more important goals than that, but it is influential. It's even more influential in an era such as we live in now where statistics are crucial as the American economist, whom I greatly admire, Hazel Henderson said, 
The structural DNA codes of nations which reflect a society's values and goals. That statistics are the, st the structural DNA codes of nations which reflect a society's values and goals and become the key drivers of economic and technological goals. So when we put in place a set of measures of progress in a formal way, they start to determine the outcomes, not simply in policy, but the actual outcomes in life chances. So if we as a nation, for example, declare that our critical goals are about economic growth, we are saying something, I guess, about our so values. How do we define social progress now as a nation? Well, I guess the answer to that is in the same way that most other nations do, and that is primarily by GDP, gross domestic product, which has been the most recognisable and influential measure of the overall progress of nations for at least 60 years now. now. Reflect on that for a minute. GDP is usually defined as the sum total of the goods and services we produce. And if you put it that way, it's a bit hard to see how that could represent an adequate definition of progress of a society. Certainly it tells you something about the amount of stuff we produce but it doesn't tell us much about the quality of life. Because when you think about it, even the most minimal definition of progress for a society or a community is bound to be complex. It necessarily will include social, environmental and governance dimensions as well as economic. It will necessarily include material and non-material aspects of individual well-being. In other words, not just income and health, but also relationships culture, meaning. And it'll also include not just the well-being of individuals, to say that we have true progress, but the functioning of our institutions, our economy, our government, and the health of our ecology. Now, I don't see how you could have even a minimal definition of the progress of a society or a community that didn't include all of those things. So, for many years now, people have been uneasy about the emphasis we place upon GDP as a measure of progress, and for various reasons. Some of them are technical, having to do with the inadequacy of GDP and taking into account a lot of things that are important. For instance, you may be aware that the GDP doesn't put any value on public health or education because it doesn't know how to. So it simply imputes the value as being the same amount as is actually spent. In other words, implying that we don't get any value or additional product, if you like, out of our public health and education. That's a technical criticism. My criticism, I guess, is um, also technical, and that is to say that GDP equals the whole progress of a nation is a bit like saying that life equals shopping. It's not a very profound definition when you think about all of the other things that a good life or a good society should include. And I don't think anyone has put this problem better than the late Robert Kennedy in 1968 in a very moving speech that he made only three weeks before he was assassinated. He pointed out many of the things that GDP measures that are not necessarily improving our life, such as air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts, the GDP counts the locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them, the destruction of the redwood, the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic sprawl, napalm and nuclear weapons. They're all positives in the GDP because they're things that are produced with a value. But what it doesn't measure, he said, is the health of our children, the quality of their education or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything, in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. An eloquent and I think quite compendious summary of the problems of over-reliance on GDP. So, if GDP isn't the answer, then what is the answer? How do we measure progress better? Well, since at least 2004, there has been developing a global movement which is effectively developing or trying to develop better measures of 
progress of a society, and it's led by the OECD, called Measuring the Progress of Society. Um, Australia has been a significant player in that, I'm very happy to say. Um, it goes back, as I said, to 2004. Australia has been a key participant in the various conferences and the various pieces of work, and Australia's Bureau of Statistics, as you probably know, is one of the leading international statistics agencies producing a different set of progress. So after, I suppose, um, nine years, um, what are the, uh, what's the consensus? What's the, what are the learnings from um, this international movement? I think there are effectively um, six points that are agreed, that have been agreed now and are formally included in a declaration called the Istanbul Declaration, some of you may be aware of, uh, which um, tries to summarise the critical learnings. The first is that the GDP, as a measure of market economic activity, might be adequate, but it's a poor measure of a society's well-being, and in fact, using it as such has negative impacts. Secondly, that societies, and I guess communities, need to develop better and more integrated or holistic measures of progress, which at a minimum take into account those five domains that I mentioned of economy, society, culture, environment and governance. But also they should take account of, and this applies in communities, community level as well, should take into account the qualitative dimensions, if you like, of progress, such as subjective well-being, how people feel, community belonging, relationships, life satisfaction and happiness, which have traditionally been left out because they were considered a bit um, new age, shall we a say. A fourth important conclusion is that the underlying problem here may not be a problem so much of measures, but of the model that we're using to define progress. And a better definition, according to the OECD, of true progress for a society is not increasing economic production, but increasing equitable and sustainable well-being. fifth conclusion, and I've mentioned it earlier, is that to develop a new set of measures of progress, a new way of thinking about progress, is a civic and democratic task, as much as it is a technical task for statisticians and policymakers. And we must find ways to in to create conversations, as they put it, in communities about progress and engage citizens, which is what the ANDI project is trying to do, and many other similar projects, because indeed there are now, uh, I was at uh, New Delhi last year at a conference where there were 1,200 people. It was the fourth international conference uh, over that period of, uh, since 2004, and uh, uh, at each one there have been roughly 1,200, and it's been a wonderful opportunity to see the work of people in local communities, in national projects. There are perhaps 100 projects around the world now where we are trying to set up new progress measures and engage citizens. So in. that's, I guess, that, that's I guess the background or the learnings which have um, informed this uh, Andy project, which I now want to spend the last 5.44 minutes <laughs> explaining to you. The Andy project uh, is a project which is attempting to develop a new set of national progress measures and an index of progress, which we hope will rival GDP, an index of national wellbeing, which would be released every year. And each month, we would release one index also of a different domain of progress, what I, what I call domains. Um, and they would be released in different months in order to capture, obviously, the, the maximum amount of attention. But those areas uh, that will be developing indexes of progress in include children and young people, communities and regions, culture, recreation and leisure, democracy and governance, economic life and prosperity, education and creativity, environment and sustainability, health, indigenous well-being, justice and fairness, subjective well-being and life satisfaction, and work life. Now, they may not be our final set of uh, domains, but we're pretty confident that they stand up to, we've already done pilot work, uh, last year, and uh, we're fairly confident that those do represent the areas that most Australians think are important for a big description or a broad model of progress. So, uh, Andy is a corporation. We became incorporated as a non-profit organisation. Uh, our two uh, key national champions are the Reverend Tim Costello and Professor Fiona Stanley. 
Uh, we have 50 uh, organisations that are members, as I said, including QCOS, uh, the ACTU, ACOS, the Red Cross, Uniting Church, the Australian Human Rights Commission and a long list of others, which you can see on our website, www.andy.net.au. And um, the members, the combined members and clients of our 50 partner groups include roughly two and a half million Australians. We uh, have just uh, signed an agreement with the Council of Learned Academies representing all Australian universities and with Deakin University to do research underpinning this work for the next five years. And um, we are uh, at the moment uh, into fundraising mode, shall we say, for a national engagement campaign which is based, and as indeed our whole project is closely based on a project called the Canadian Index of Wellbeing, uh, which has been going now for 10 years. And that project is, like ours, a community initiative, citizen-driven, starting from the same principles, developing an index. They, you can see on the Canadian Index of Wellbeing website what that index looks like. It's a wonderful thing. Um, I've been involved in, uh, on the committee for, to develop that now for about eight years and I look after or help to look after the area around citizenship and democracy measures, which are an important part of their uh, index. The publication of that index in Canada gives you a completely different perspective on whether the community is truly making progress. And if you look at the website, you will see that in the last 12 years GDP increased a total of 30% in Canada and overall wellbeing increased about 11%. And it, you can see exactly in what areas wellbeing went forward and where it went backwards. I think that, that's a, a crucially important tool, but especially when it's based on regular engagement of the community. And what we'll be doing with the Andy project is setting up 12 domain groups in each of those areas I mentioned. Uh, which will include citizens and uh, stakeholders, uh, policy makers and academics and researchers working on the same set of questions, namely what are the important things to measure for progress in, let's say, education? What are the important indicators? How do we develop an index? And those are all fitted together, if you like, into an aggregate index. Um, so uh, the Andy project, um, as I said, is I guess the child of the global movement, but it's also very much a child of developments in Australia. And one of those uh, progenitors, shall we say, has been the community movement, because as you know, many of you here are involved. Uh, local governments and communities around Australia have been wrestling with the problem of what is community wellbeing, how we measure it, how we engage citizens in it. Uh, partly because we have to do it under statutes here in Queensland and in most other states. There are requirements for community planning, which has to engage uh, citizens, although I must say different states do it with varying degrees of efficiency and enthusiasm. But uh, in Victoria, we have legislation which says that every local government has to develop a four-year plan, and I believe it's 10 here, uh, for wellbeing in the community, which covers these areas and which uh, engages the citizens and which uh, develops indicators to measure progress. So the government's required to say what progress is. Now, I know that they don't all do it and they don't do it very well, but it's an important platform and vehicle for all of us who believe in this to use and to strengthen as far as we can. So Andy represents, um, I guess, uh, development or pays homage to the development from local communities. It also has a leg in the global scene because we're trying to apply those six lessons that I mentioned uh, from the international work here in Australia. And my belief is we'll do it better than even the Canadians, whom I love dearly, and I think they are the world pioneers at the moment with their Canadian index of wellbeing. But we can do it better. We can do it better because, um, well, we stand on their shoulders to some extent and we can learn from them, which is terrific. But also I think the idea of having um, this rolling debate, the problem with the Canadian index is partly that it only comes out once a year. Now, the GDP comes out four times a year and provokes a huge um, welling up of comment from 17-year-olds in the Macquarie Bank and many others as well which goes on for days and days and everyone makes predictions and everyone knows exactly what it means but of course they get it wrong every time. 
uh, and it's as though that's the only game in town. Well, if we have uh, an index of national progress, it's well-founded, well-developed, uh, strongly based on community uh, preferences and regularly checking back with the community, uh, and which also produces uh, an index every, every month, a different one, of all of these different areas, with, of course, comments from the relevant stakeholders already primed to make comments about why we're getting better or worse in health or education, and what we should do about it. Because it isn't just say, saying, here's an index. It's saying, here's an index, and it's made up of 12 key indicators, and these are the indicators which show that we've done well or badly, and why we've done well or badly is probably because of this, and what we need to do about it is this. So having that kind of focus, having it at a high level, something that's got the entire university sector, I mean, I'm still, we're still having some trouble herding them into the same bag, but um, uh, I think that's going to happen because I think it's, uh, the project has got the blessing of the Chief Scientist and the Australian Council of Learned Academies. So I think it will be good work and I think it'll be legitimate based on community preferences. So I hope when you get uh, something, in the post or um, whatever it is that you'll be aware of, Andy, and that you'll um, persuade your organisation to support it. Because what we want, we've got 50 uh, partner groups now, what we want is 500. We want this to be owned by the communities. We don't want it to be an academic thing, we want it to be something that everyone respects, as it is in Canada, understands and respects.